starting departing from a community level. Um, we don't have a moderator, so I will guide you through the session, but I will also introduce you to permaculture as an enabler of regenerative thinking and, and practice. And, but however, first of all, I would like to introduce you, introduce you to the other wonderful speakers. So we have with us, or joining us in, there you are, Isa, just in time. Nice to see you. Great to have you. So we have with us uh, Isabella Luz. She's a communication expert and activist for cultural, human rights, and socio-environmental causes. And she's the institutional manager of Instituto Procomun in Santos in Sao Paulo, Brazil. And she will tell us about uh, the Institute's commons work later on. And then we have Bruna Zanoli, who works with Rizomatica in partnership with the Association for Progressive Communication, where she leads the shaping connectivity area of the LockNet project. Uh, supporting communities of practice implementations and local services for community networks. And then we have our own gig member, Niels Brock. He's a journalist and media developer with focus on community media and community networks. And he coordinates the open source digital news from Colmena of the Deutsche Welle Academy, but he also collaborates with the LockNet project on the exploration of local digital services. So welcome to all of you. Really, really pleased to have you with us. So. Let's start. So there's no doubt that AI provides impressive technological and efficiency gains. Uh, generative AI or large language models provide great opportunities. We can think of regenerative smart city practices. We can think of inclusion agendas when it comes to language diversity. But AI and other big tech industries heavily resource extractive. And it has a massive impact on the environment and in consequence, the sustainability of life on our oil planet. And basically, we have two man-made forces, which are climate change and which is AI focus on. And yeah, the energy required to run AI tasks is accelerating with an annual growth rate between 26 and 36 percent. Computational power needed for sustaining AI growth is doubling roughly every 100 days. And paradoxically, improvements in technological efficiency, particularly the advent of generative AI, prompt increased demand and greater resource consumption. It's a yeah, rebound effect known as the Chavins paradox, which basically echoes what happened in the 19th century coal use. So to date, an absolute decoupling of GDP from energy seems impossible. And we also see a reforced digital divide, communities benefiting from modern internet and data infrastructures and those communities whose land and labor are essential for the production of these uh, infrastructures, but who are disproportionately exposed to the negative material and social impacts of the technology and are commonly mis uh, more disconnected as well. So turning to AI for efficiency gains alone is just not good enough. And we need a, a paradigm shift here. Mm. So we need a cal recalibration of our relationship with technology, basically with everything. And ecology lens, which we focus on, uh, enables to attend yeah, the full effects of AI and advanced tech it incorporates and enables the navigation of complexity, basically. And to refer to the writing of biologist Daniel, Daniel Wahl, a sustainable regenerative system is a system that is nested appropriately in that complexity that we are participating in. And the comprehension that no cell on this planet is autosufficient. So any system we are dealing with has a permeable boundary to the larger context from the individual to our biosphere and all the stages in between. So it's part of it. To be regenerative is to manifest one's own unique contribution to that larger system and to remake our symbiosis with the world, to understand the actual necessities and respond to those. So if not, we create functional gaps in, in what purely labels sustainability and, and regenerative practices or efforts. Yeah, but how are we define, defining or how can we define these necessities? A lot of related narratives at the moment focus on the what. So, and, and utilizing the, the popular narrative, we often hear at the moment humans doing things as nature, as like a kind of trending framework, can only be misleading or basically are, are abstract if we con are conscious that the, or about the fact that 56% of the world population live in cities. And the urban population will more than double by 2050. So where do that, or where do we start? Mm, 
ecological thinking and doing is not is not linear. It's not cut off in in, in categories um, to to understand it and make it efficient. It's indefinite. It's moving, ever moving. It's deeply transcontextual, to use the term of of Nora Bateson. And um, yeah, complex problems require deeply relational and collaborative approaches. I use a quote from a recent interesting white paper of Doug Medelevs stating, decoupling of our economy from material, energy, land, and species extraction will be driven by growth of care, participation, collective intelligence, new forms of logistics, and other immaterial values. But the thing is that our systems are rooted in separation and control and build very much on linearity and, and siloing. So cultivating concrete how driven systemic ecological proposition and guidance to nurture in nurture the contrary for organizational, for governance, for financial, etc. models will be of central importance. And well at Cultiva Lab, uh, so my project, we we work with the permaculture to guide people and organizations and how to embrace this complexity and concretely enact regenerative practices. And permaculture provides guidance for weighting out or weighing our decisions and, and actions far beyond permanent or regenerative agriculture, what is largely often just known for. And it basically mimics the patterns and relationships we can find in nature and can be applied to all aspects of, of human habitation, from agriculture to ecological building, from appropriate technology to education and economics. And it makes clear how we can't perceive nor address those domains in, in silos. And for me, permaculture is incredible, incredibly useful to guide people on this journey because we can work with permaculture in two ways. So one is the actual regenerative agricultural practice and, and what relates to that. So this experience, right? Introducing people to and providing people with like lived experience of this practice to me shows to be incredibly nurturing process on an individual level and in transmitting the power of community and, and collaboration and collectivity in this process. And Practically, that, that really relates from people exploring actual soil, not to planting, but also to whatever, experiencing using a toilet where you don't flush down 12,000 liters of actual drinking water a year, things like that. So really this hands-on collaborative experience of things. And the other is the use of the permaculture philosophy as a concrete and well-applicable framework you can use for strategy co-creation, for research, for policy processes, processes to guide people, organizations, or institutions to think and act in ecological systemic manners through a simple set of principles. Um, yeah, in a transcontextual, to get back to that um, way, so to say. And I will briefly introduce that, that letter, so the, the framework. So permaculture is based on three underlying ethics, earth care, people care, fair share. Earth care can, well, can be seen as meaning caring for the, for, for the living soil, the state of, of soil, after all, is, is a great measure of the health and well-being of society. And it's largely depleted, as we know. Um, all life forms have own intrinsic an own intrinsic value and need to be respected for the functions that they perform. So even if we don't see them as useful to, to our immediate needs in that moment. So remember what we said about the, the permeable boundaries before, no, of every of every system in a system. And then we have people care, which focuses largely on the need for companionship, for collaborative efforts. Uh, to to affect change, the challenge mostly is to grow. Yeah, through self reliance and, and personal responsibility in a in a process. And people care really begins with with ourselves and expands to include to to our families, to our communities, to our institutions, etc. And then we have fair share, which relates to setting limits and and re redistributing surplus. So the impossibility of continuous growth has become evident in the growth in human consumption and accelerating extinction, extinction of species we are facing. And basically, we need to make hard decisions and, and consider what enough is. And this is where that part comes in. So thinking about energy, for instance, also if we use renewable energy, we still use it. And the density of what is needed is not sustainable. So the economy depends on energy, it's energy. So no holding this reality. So we have the three ethics and then we have 12 design principles, which I can't go into detail now. I've listed them here. Uh, the principles are basically guiding every action, every decision in a permaculture process. So each principle can be thought of as like a door that opens up to into whole system thinking or, or practice. Um, 
providing different perspectives that can be understood at varying levels of depth and application. And these ethics and principles are applied to seven domains that you see here, which are required to create a sustainable culture. And they are all in separately interconnected. So most people associate permaculture with regenerative agriculture, as I said before. And well, basically land and nature stewardship, one of the domains, one of the paddles of the flower, so to say. Um, land and steward, uh, nature stewardship, understanding how nature works is from where we, we get our understanding no? or at first place and understanding the role of nature and how we are separately interwoven, to I mentioned before. And together with uh, the segments here of building and tools and, and technology, these three are sometimes perceived as like the infra, the hard infrastructure of permaculture, but there are four more domains to weave in if we really want to achieve a sustain, sustainable and, and just future. And they are intrinsically interwoven and without hierarchy, that's the important part here. So they are, you know, they are all to be perceived on, on the same level of importance. So basically permaculture, permaculture framework as such guides us in unlearning separation and unlearning the separation that we often function in also in our systems, no? in the structures of our systems, of our institutions. And it's not meant to set in stone framework and provides the option to dive into specific domains, but always being able to check back in. How does our doing relate to the other domains? How do we need to engage in other domains, enable change in other domains in order to achieve regenerative, regenerative dynamics? In one, etc. So just think about how people's understanding and, and subsequent use of technology, for instance, is influenced by our knowledge systems, by our growth models, etc. So that's a bit where this comes into, into reality, no? into play. And imagine if we shape systems from local to city to bioregions, etc., that are making these decisions, decisions strictly in a transcontextual manner, radically medically matched against all the, the principles no? that we saw before. So permaculture is a systemic model, and that's where I, I see its strength. But there's another very important aspect, and that is the spiral you see here. So the evolutionary spiral path, which connects the domains initially at a personal and local level, so departure point, and then proceeds to the collective and global level. So there's attention to our individual and community health and well-being as a structurally integrated element, something that we haven't had in that way in our system so far, right? Or yeah, said in another way, our individual and collective organizational well-being is intrinsically related to the tools and institutions we ultimately build and ultimately the governance we have. So enacting this aspect as central in the permaculture framework is a core strength of it. And to run this up, briefly linking back to, to technology. If we apply these principles, extractive tech practices basically should become obsolete. Then AI is not about like a race to find out the, the best or the, all the opportunities it, it holds or to use it for our pure convenience and self-focused comfort, right? It shifts the perspective on it. So the permaculture approach to technology basically brings back things back into into scale and I will leave it with this thank you for your patience and I would directly love to hand over to Isa in order to tell us how at La Procomun you work with the commons approach yes thank you so much can I um present I do have a presentation can I open it Yes, you can. I will just stop my screen sharing and now you should be able to share your screen. Let me, let me see it. I'm not really good with Zoom. I'm really, I'm most used to, um, how can I, let me see it. In, in the menu on the bottom, where oh, you see the yeah. chat, and there is a, um, one icon with a with an arrow that points to the top. I, I, I have it in German, so I don't know what in what in English or in <laughs> in Portuguese it says there. Maybe someone can help out. And if you click on it, then you can choose your Yeah, I have um app uh, window. 
but it doesn't it doesn't show up in in a presentation mode. I don't know if that's it. Let me see it. Um, oh yeah, I think yeah, I think we're good. Super. Yes. Are okay, you able to can. see it? Perfect. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. yes. Thank you. Okay. So um so hello everyone. How are you? I hope you uh, you're good and safe and well. Um, firstly, I want to. Cecily, thank Gig for this important space for dialogue. I think um, it's also a pleasure um, to be here with you and also to have like a discussion, a space for discussion, right? Um, as I was introduced, my name is Isabella. I'm from the Procomum Institute in Brazil. And um, the discussion and intersection between ecology and innovation um, to me, is really interesting, uh, whether in the sense of non-human and human technology. And, um, but more than that, it is directly connected to the, to the work that we do here in, in, in Labri Procomum and in Procomum. Um, Labri, Labri Procomum, it's our citizen lab. It, it is, um, it is located in Santos, in an area called Baixada Santista. And Procomum activates network through citizen innovation um, to respond and to develop solutions for the major issues that we face today. Um, and we completely believe that the major issue that we have to tackle um, for humanity really is climate change. And both um, just doing an overview of Lab Pro Comum and myself. Um, Lab Pro Comum and I, um, I was born in Baixada Santista uh, in Santos. It is a coastal region um, in Brazil and in the state of Sao Paulo. So if you look from above, this image is really interesting because it's. Um, uh, NASA took this image and you can see this vast area of this green vast area and then you can see this um, this space where Sao Paulo is and Sao Paulo is the biggest um, city in Latin America so it's huge and big and and super deforested as well and but Baixada Sanchista is a green area where 46% of its territory is still covered by preserved areas of the Atlantic forest. And the Atlantic forest is one of the most biodiverse and rich biomes in the world. Um, originally goes across 17 states in Brazil. Um, at the same time, the Atlantic forest is the most degraded biome in Brazil. So 88% of its original vegetation is deforested. So this fact also intersects with Baixada Santista since is one of the most urbanized areas in Sao Paulo state. Um, however, I don't want to take these facts and conclude um, that human action has failed to preserve. I don't think it's the path that we want to, to take. Um, in Procomum, when we talk about the environment, we are also talking about social environmental justice. Um, we think about how many animals, um, both human and non-human, have been wiped out um, just like the Atlantic forests in this territory, right? And um, I want to just also do an overview of the issue that we face in Baixada Santista. In Brazil, violence in Brazil is really, um, is big, right? Is, uh, is impactful in our daily lives. But last summer, <clears throat> 80 people were killed by military police um, in Sao Paulo, of Sao Paulo in a public security operation called Operação Escudo and Operação Verão. And this event was, was actually celebrated by some part of, of the population and the government um, 
And we are talking about one of the first territories in Brazil to be colonized. And um, this also express, um, expresses in a deeper aspect how we are not, preserva not preserva preservating life, right? And what we think about is how can we reforest forests and mangroves without thinking about the humans who inhabit these places. Um, in Pracomum, uh, we believe that preserving <clears throat> rivers, seas, forests, and lands is um, only possible if we create solutions to these challenges in alliance with those who experience them daily, who are in the territory, um, particularly the indigenous, um, the black, the peripheral, LGBTQIA, um, and street population. And this is what I would like to um, add to the conversation, right? The notion of the commons that we believe in and that we practice every day here in, in Procomu. And I want to um, um, quote Ailton Krenaki, that is um, an indigenous leader um, and also speaks a lot about the climate crisis, but from a human experience, right? And for him, um, the ones in panic um, are the humans <clears throat> and the artificial world that we've created. The system that has entered into crisis, suppressing diversity and becoming disconnected from the, from the earth. And to me, it's really interesting because I'm also a designer. Um, and during the, during the pandemic, I was also really interesting, uh, interested in, in permaculture as a way of just um, being a more aware of how to connect with the, with the earth, you know, and to be part of it. And I've been thinking a lot about this, um, these a few days when, when Kirsi contacted me and I was really inspired because here in Procomun, we dispute the future and the imagination of the future through reforestation and opposing monoculture, opposing sanitation, opposing the apathy that we are currently um. I believe that is the, the current narrative, right? And I could talk a lot about uh, our impact results, how many people we've been mobilizing through these years, how many projects we carry out, um, our territorial reach. But I think it's, to me, it's more interesting when I think, when I talk about the people and how we do it, and with whom we do it. So <clears throat> our ecosystem that we created here in, in Procomu and especially in Labi Procomu is vast and, and diverse. And just like an agroforest, um, to me, it's a, it's a work of planting, creating prosperous environment, making mistakes, getting things right, observing, letting things die also, and um, sometimes changing course, right? Um, I believe that we, like nature, make room for what it is labeled as failure. And in our citizen labs, we encourage collaboration and the construction of uh, an ecosystem that um, nurtures and protects itself. So placing care at the center, I think is the, the, the main object for ourselves. Um, but never forgetting the conflicts that can arise from it, right? And we understand that the relationships and the bonds between people and the environment um, also exist in the invisible and the intangible. So, um, Victor, that is our innovation manager at Labi Procomun, always says that we are allowed to fail. You know, the persistence and, and the day-to-day -day effort um, are what matters the most 
it is in these days and in these moments that beauty of diversity needs to space to be. Um, so the Lab Pro Comun right now currently hosts more than 29 maker communities. So our 29 collectives, more than two, um, 200 people um, every day going by and people who are capable of mobilizing ambitious pro projects um, in our territory, addressing socioeconomic challenges through collectivity. And I think that's the most important um, aspect for us. Um, our, our work is to open a space for this mutation, you know? Um, and that's why I prefer to talk about the incredible people um, people who are part of our community. And I brought three people that I, I really like, and I think there are cases that we were, really showcase. Um, we were, we were that really showcase. I think someone was, is with um, their mic open. <laughs> um, but uh, I brought three, three histories actually to, to that showcase this diversity. And the first one is Alessandra, and Ale has been attending to La Vipra um, has been for two years now. And the challenge that Ale faces as someone who lives on the streets and struggles with the, the accumulation of objects um, that she feels are part of her often causes discomfort within our community. However, it's so rich having her around and she has exercised our ability to coexist. And she often gets upset with us as well because um, sometimes we, our institutional cap caps, um, we do have institutional restrictions, right? Um, we can go until one point and, but it was interesting because um, she also has opened up to being there every day with us, understanding that we have limitations with her struggles. So this is possible because we are committed to living with the differences and having, um, and we've been having uh, a moment to really learn to establish limits to both hers and, and ours. And I also want to um, talk about Lua. Lua is my Tupi Guarani, is a, an indigenous, uh, one of the biggest indigenous populations in, in Sao Paulo. And, um, and he's a teacher, in, uh, Tupi Guarani indigenous teacher. And it has been a mission for Labi Pro Comun to be the closest that we can to the indigenous populations as well. And it's interesting because when we invite people with a cosmology, with a way of thinking life that opposes any idea of capitalism, productivity and time, discomfort can arise um, in this collective. How much space um, do we leave for, for these other timelines to be respected? And, um, being honest, it's not easy. <laughs> and because bureaucracy and time of others also interfere and cause conflicts, but it's absolutely worth it to challenge ourselves, to think through ways of life that provoke us to rethink our practices, um, which also I, I believe we are tackling in a, such organic way, the colonial logic that is imposed in our territory when we invite and give space for other views of life. And um, I also want to talk about Consa, and Consa is a very wise person who, he knows a lot about the history of Baixada Santista. He knows um, a lot about self-care. He cares about others. And he participates in almost all activities that we propose. 
even so, despite being absolutely open to coexist um, with people of different ages, he has had generational tensions with um, people from the lab community. However, I think what is the most, the beauty of it is that the group was open to solving the issue rather than punishing his mistake. Uh, so the community created a collective and political action that helped um, helped him navigate through the conflict. And we then were, all, were able to foster new references and bonds of, of coexistence. So we have developed a repertoire of um, for similar sim situations that can arise in the future, we will have more tools to handle them. And I, I believe that <clears throat> for us, I'm sorry, for us listening and observing and putting energy into this community with care, respect, is the path that we've been we'll be we've been um really going through um how can we cultivate an ecology driven agenda as a global maker community and i really like this question because for us in procommun is about putting life at center um is also about practicing tools to face extreme challenges and building prosperous environments and this ecosystem of people that succeeds through um, the human strength to persist, to correct, to improve and to confront. Um, knowing that what drives these groups forward is a common desire. And I hope that we can be inspired and continue to have an abundant and creative vision looking for strategies for our collective well-being and agreements for staying alive together. And I think that's it. I think that's what, for us, it's the most important thing. I'm leaving my contents here, please. Um, if you want to contact me, um, be, I would gladly <laughs> continue the conversation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Isa. I'm a, I'm a very great fan of Instituto Pro. That's known. <laughs> <laughs> that's uh, that's known. But uh, yeah, thanks so much for actually giving this life to when what we mean with you know opposing and breaking through monocultures and and what frictions that can actually really bring and how they are just integrative part of life and community and. At the end, mm. where frictions, where there are cracks, it's, it's where water enters, it's where light enters, it's where energy enters, right? So. Thank you so much and also for rounding up with the call for and also the attention you guys have on actually listening because in in the regenerative agricultural practice that's all about listening and observing yes. before doing before anything and that's something that has to be learned because it costs no a conventionally mm. trained human being to step back to listen and listen as long as it takes no before before acting so thank you so much thank really inspiring <laughs> and yeah I, I i'd like to to hand over then to to bruna and niels to share your lognut experiences and work with us yeah hi everyone and uh yeah thanks for the kind introduction kirsty also for the great presentation isa uh, and Kirsty, very inspiring. Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, my name is Niels, and uh, I often end up as timekeeper. So having uh, an eye on the clock, I will try to be the link for Bruna sharing her experiences uh, and uh, just throw in some uh, yeah linking ideas, I, I hope. And something I would like to, to start with is a reflection on the, the agency when we talk about permaculture or the, the commons. Uh, so who's there? So uh, what brings us together as more individual makers uh, sometimes with an entrepreneur uh, take? And then also, uh, we also heard a lot about talking about we, the movement. Uh, so uh, I think there is like in a collective agency and the collective reality and the belonging and uh, one of the terms and that brings us also to the project that uh, Bruna and I work with and uh, uh, have to do with communities and the work with communities. And uh, so maybe uh, 
the first thing that is important if you reflect of how do we relate to communities and, and, and what they are is the term is used as a buzzword in, in many, many ways and it's used for many marketing purposes as well. And I think in the 1950s, the international Sitionist movements, they, they had it right if they talked about the detournement, about the uh, rerouting and the hijacking of terms. So we can take away terms from the ad industry like the, the ad busters did, but sometimes uh, also the uh, the ad industry or the, the marketing people, they strike back and they take us uh, our terms. So community uh, has been used to label and to brand many experiences. And so I think, uh, first of all, it's a, it's a shared challenge here uh, to be like outspoken about what we mean with this term and to be vocal. And uh, so that brings me to my second point that I wanted to, to address. That's a bit, okay, how can we define um, uh, or discuss community and instead of having like a definition that fits all, uh, I just wanted to introduce two um, moments or like two approaches uh, of how to do it um, and based on principles. So to say, okay, instead of uh, uh, telling everybody what is a community, let's talk about principles that we share and then uh, from there uh, take it up. And that has been um, the work, for instance, of the LogNet initiative, the uh, local network initiative that is working with uh, communities community networks, or as we call them also now, community-centered connectivity initiatives around the world, uh, that is to say communities that uh, care and uh, organize to have their own infrastructure to uh, create their own ways of meaningful connectivity and uh, to connect with the world. And something that has came out recently, it has not published yet, but I can share them here in the chat, have been this list of, uh, <coughs> excuse me, of principles, for instance, or to say, okay, when we talk about um, what can be defining principles for the for the work with communities, uh, this could be a good basis. And it doesn't mean that all of these principles have to be applied in the same way. Um, a way to uh, address this kind of uh, how we collaborate would also be, okay, what are fundamental principles that are important to us? So uh, human rights might be something that we don't want to discuss at every meeting. Others might be more, uh, aspirational principles that uh, or values uh, that we uh, would like to work uh, to. And uh, that is something, I guess, that is not only uh, happening with the work with communities uh, uh, or community networks in our case, but also in a, in a broader sense. And uh, I was uh, bringing also another examples that are the feminist principles of the internet that some of you might know. I'm posting the link here as well. And in a very similar way, it's also a space uh, of reflection and and uh, uh, how to understand uh, what can principles be uh, to uh, create a common ground, uh, a commune, a pro commun as uh, Isa has, has, has talked about it, uh, for, for collective action. And I think there's something interesting um, that uh, yeah, I wanted to bring and share also with the, with the makers movement to, uh, to reflect on uh, a bit. And um, last not least, um, on the term commons, it was also in the title. Uh, I think it was really nice how ESA and, and the work in Brazil has grounded the concept because uh, in other occasions, the commons have remained like a, a concept that is very much understood. It's something that comes from the global north that is not uh, uh, related to the realities and the cosmologies of the, uh, of the people. And uh, you, you did this kind of translation, but I also wanted to invite and to remember maybe that there are um, other uh, examples of cosmologies and of, of concepts that also come from the uh, global majority, for instance, the term of Ubuntu, uh, this kind of idea of I am what I am because of who are we all, uh, or the concept uh, from Latin America, the bon vivir, or, uh, bon vivir or buen vivir, like the how could it say good living, a good living, a good livelihood? So to say, okay, let's have a more holistic view also of uh, how we relate and uh, how we live together, and to decenter a bit uh, human agency and to have a more systematic and uh, systemic, sorry, and an uh, ecosystem approach of what we're doing, um, very much aligned also with the systemic model uh, that. Uh, uh, Kirsty presented in the beginning. So I think there are many crossroads and overlaps and uh, um, also referring to what uh, Kirsty shared about the enabling regeneration, um, just briefly touching also on Colmena as a um, 
uh, open source software solution because the three dimension that Kirsty mentioned there, uh, we can uh, also find them there. So if we talk about earth care, um, we framed it at, uh, as terrestrial technologies um, based on uh, some work from Bruno Latour. So to say, don't invent anything that could be working, but it cannot be sustained by the resources that are available on, on planet Earth. So we can invent and uh, innovate many things and they will work. Starlink maybe is a good example. So it's working, but is it, is it sustainable? Is it like something that uh, uh, with the resources that we have at hand uh, can really work? Is it just bringing closer to destruction rather? So having this take on, on earth care, people care, I think uh, this has also been a journey and recently we're working a lot together with cooperatives and social enterprises. Uh, seeing here Eric from Wacoma also in the uh, in the crowd, nice, uh, nice to see you here. So th this is also about like, okay, care also refers uh, to the development spaces. So, and what can be good conditions of care for people developing um, uh, developing tools. And I think this is also something that applies a lot to the, to the maker community. And last but not least, fair share. Uh, and I think open source uh, is still uh, a principle that we um, that we cherish and uh, have in, in common um, for this work. And so without further words, I uh, pass it over to Bruna to also uh, share with um, more of experiences and to yeah, don't get entangled with the with the concepts. Thanks for your attention. Thank you, Niels. Um, hi, folks. Uh, thanks. It's really good to see a lot of friends here in the call. Uh, good morning, and, and thanks, uh, Kirsty, for the invitation. Uh, it's a, a good way to start a, a, a Wednesday to reflect on those those. Uh, beautiful concepts and experiences. And I was lucky enough to learn about that, um, not by the terms or the narratives, but uh, by uh, traditional populations and territories that uh, although they, they don't call it uh, permaculture or, or agroecology, the, 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 the practices are really, um, uh, you know, the, the concept of agriculture doesn't involve poison or anything. Uh, I was uh, I was reflecting on that uh, on on that uh, uh, phrases that got famous a while ago about uh, artificial intelligence. That was uh, I want uh, uh, AI to do my laundry and dishes, not my writing and art. And I think this is a great way to to look at it. Um, so I was wondering uh, if if we can uh, substitute writing in art for agriculture, or uh, I don't know permaculture, or understanding agriculture as as you know uh, um, making healthy food and not um, and not anything else than that. Uh, and not only because uh, uh, you know it's it's healthier for for the people and for the planet, but also because it tastes better. Just, you know, uh, food from family farmers just tastes so much better. And I think we end up uh, forgetting, you know, about um, how, how the easiest, uh, the simplest way to do things sometimes is the best way just because, uh, yeah, you, you don't need to, to put that many layers on a process that has been done for for generations, um, and um, yeah, I think with with the work on on LockNet, uh, we and 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 in in Brazil mainly the the communities we work with are traditional populations and territories. So uh, when we uh, are approached by them or, or have uh, this contact about the technologies to use, the connectivity technologies, uh, and you know, try to build a, a community-centered uh, communications or connectivity project. Um, it's, it's, it's very easy to talk about the concept of commons because they already have that indeed on their daily lives. So when we... Um, uh, talk about an infrastructure that has that same principle or a technology that has that same principle. It's, 
it's easy to understand because people already live uh, a life of, of uh, commons and sharing resources. Uh, so it's, um, it's very, uh, it's very uh, easy, you know, it's, it's, a uh, when you look at the, the commons, not only as a concept, but how people actually live their daily lives. And I learn a lot from that. For me, it's, um, it's, uh, always a very, um, fulfilling experience because, um, as you said, uh, Kirsty, a, a lot of people are living in the cities, but uh, it's so hard to have those uh, those moments of commons on the city. I think, um, as Isabella shared with the Lab Pro Comun, there are some possibilities. We also support some uh, CN projects in in urban peripheries uh, that uh, that embed this concept of commons uh, and in a more uh, shared way, no? in a more uh, practical way. Um, but uh, w one thing uh, I've been uh, thinking also about uh, AI and, and how the technology reaches uh, the, the places uh, and, 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 you know, takes a lot from, from cultures and from uh, traditional ways of lives. Uh, and at least here in Brazil, and I think in other places, uh, usually uh, we, we have seen that there is more investment on connecting the tractors on the rural areas and the farms than actually to connect the family farmers and the agricultures. So you have a tractor that is doing the harvest, uh, maybe driveless or or just you know on a using a lot of uh cut edge technology and then 500 meters away you have a family farmer uh that don't have any means of communication and if they have any problems uh they won't be able to to reach for help because there's no uh mobile uh signal or anything like that um at the same time, it's not about just uh, for them to to have that connectivity and to have those uh, those means to 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 communicate without uh, you know consent, uh, without actually understanding the impact that those technologies uh, might have. You know, this artificial life that can access that uh, we we kind of create for ourselves and. We in Locknet are, are very careful careful not to not to uh, to hierarchize technologies and say that uh, you know internet is better than than uh, whatever other means of communication they had. I mean, it, it's a tool, it's a useful tool, and can be used for many things. But uh, they can also create their own internet and their own forms of communication, and we try to. Um, to foster that as much as we can. Uh, and I think because of the nature of the communities and their visions of already having a more community and commons view, it's, uh, you know, uh, the technologies that they potentially can create are much better because they embed those values. So uh, for me, it's not a matter of, of yes or no, to have or not to have the connectivity or, but uh, how, how can we uh, foster this, uh, this feminist concept, uh, which is, you know, consent and, you know, informed consent uh, to actually uh, have the people on board for connectivity projects, knowing uh, what they uh, are going, um, uh, what they are um, consenting to, you know, and how they can uh, co-create that space, co-participate and adapt those technologies. So uh, that's why uh, the possibility of having local services is so powerful in my view and, and my colleagues view, because uh, then it's not only about what you already have, but about all the possibilities and 
uh, the, of communication and and uh, like I I went saw this uh, this elderly um, man listening to the earth to see what was needed in terms of uh, of um, natural fertilizants for the for the the earth to to grow better. Uh, they have a, a a problem of a, a plague or something and like i don't want ai to take that away because when he's uh his grandson look at him he was doing the same so like i don't think uh artificial intelligence or or uh, another kind of um of outside knowledge can at anyhow uh beat that or even compete with that kind of knowledge and i really hope that uh we can use uh, this outside technology to support the local knowledge, not to destroy it, because that's what uh, has been happening a lot. Um, so I think I'll I'll close with that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bruna and Niels. Uh, super interesting to to learn about. Yeah, how you work with local communities, and yeah, I think what what you. Uh, the the example you now with the tractor you mentioned actually Pruna it's a, it's just a great one example for how you know when we think about technology it's not only about you know AI bringing in communication infrastructure but it's it's all kind of technological advancements that come in from this tech driven uh, imposing position and uh, thanks for for elaborating how how you actually work from that other perspective and that's the essence no of departing from contextualities departing from place and all the diversity in each single context and then gradually looking at if and what type of technology or infrastructure is beneficial to to the processes to the cultures to the needs of whatever community we work with no so really flipping that whole process upside down that often dominates um, systems. So thank you so much. Being aware of the time, I, I'd like to to open up and see if there are comments or questions or any type of input from our, our audience, the people who joined our session. Please just speak up or raise your hand, whatever you feel comfortable with. Yeah, hi. Hey, Ofrey. Uh, yeah, I would like to talk about this, uh, let's say, non-AI approach to to the talks, like, like, yeah, now AI is like uh, making every conversation about AI, and and uh, yeah, today we have a non AI uh, powered talk because it's about like community and diversity and yeah, this this uh, conviviality approaches. Uh, so yeah, thanks for for this refreshing approach in the in the age of AI. Um, yeah, maybe maybe you would like to to talk about this, uh, for me, there is an important question that is, what is AI making invisible? Now that we are talking every time about AI, the influence of AI, how we, how we are going to align our agendas with AI funding and all that stuff. For me, it's important every time that we have this kind of uh, so-called revolutions to think about what the revolution, well, the fashionist revolution is making invisible. So yeah, I don't know if any of the of the speakers of today can or would like to talk about that. Yeah. He's uh, Niels Bruna. Otherwise, I can say something. Anyone wants to respond to Afre? Well, maybe just briefly from, you know, when, when you say, what is AI making invisible? I mean, one thing is like, I see a total repetition. Now it's AI, before it was another te te tech focus, you know, infrastructure focus. The big question is like, when do we finally understand that that narrative, that, you know, that departure point has to shift and how do we get that at policy levels at, you know, like 
where, where decisions are made, but mainly where funding flows, because uh, one dilemma I see is that a lot of funding that we all often depend on, unfortunately, is tech determined. Like, so funds that are shaped around a technology for tech determinant focus, and that puts us into, you know, like chains of uh, departing from what we actually work from. So where is, are the, you know, the grants that actually generally the grants that give attention to all the community work that flows into these processes. You know, someone, I don't remember who it was, I think Pruna or Niels, who uh, before also mentioned, you know, the, the great work that, or was it in the chat, that all our programs, all our developers are doing. But there are a lot of cultural clashes between our communities, although we are in one communities, developers, community workers, we speak different languages and we build our communities like gig also, no? To, to navigate that and to nurture like a, a shared language and way of collaborating. But the, there are never, never fundings for that. And that's a, for me, the biggest dilemma we are facing. And now it's called AI before it was called in different ways. Basically ever since the internet, we are dealing with this. So I also a lot like, okay, now it's called AI, but the discourse is the same and the struggle we have remains largely the same, right? Yeah, and I would like to add to Kirsty because I think the the issue that we are facing, um, it was before that, right? It was it it is about communication. What are we communicating in a vast um for a vast uh, um audience, right? And it is just like Bruna said. If you go to the um communities the oral uh, history, it doesn't show up in, in, in the internet. The AI doesn't, just like I was, I was asking AI, what are the commons um, um, specialists? And, uh, and I know that, so he, he, he sent to me all those commons specialists and writers and but I'm not speaking about those people. I want to um, know about the history and about the people who are practicing the commons. And AI and the internet will never show it. Will never show those communities. They are super, super, super um, um, restricted in these territories. And to me, they are actually protected. <laughs> we are. We actually have to protect. You know. Um, I, I believe we have to protect people from the internet and not the opposite in, in the sense that um, the like globalization and this the sense of this monoculture, really, this is the, the struggle that, that we are facing right now. And um, I really hope that we continue to have um, spaces where internet is not I don't know. I, I hope we have some blank spaces in the world, you know, at the if we have years going by. At the Amazon right now, we have um what is the internet of the Elon Musk? Um the Starlink. Now we have Starlink um for many indigenous communities. And this brings a lot of things that are they're really good and a lot of things that are really bad. And um but it's, it it is those are the struggles. I think if we if we look to these communities that that continue to be really high uh, really isolated, in how many years you know their their local culture their own culture will be vanished. I think this is the 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 main issue, and it really worries me. <laughs> Just like you guys um like Ofre. Thank you, Isa. Niels, you also raised your hand. Yeah, we are already over time, but just a quick uh, comment, maybe in the same direction. So I think there's also the, the, the thing of pushing solutions on people. And then AI is such a thing to say, like, whatever is the, the, the question, the answer is AI. Before it was chocolate, so as the, uh, the, I like that better. So, uh, But uh, so the, the thing is, there should be like a needs-based approach and uh, some uh, solutions. And uh, coming back to this term of... Uh, 
terrestrial technologies. So there, there might be AI solutions for things that could be done in a more simpler way. Uh, and so uh, so it doesn't have to be uh, AI always. And uh, there should be this, this openness of thinking and also uh, coming back to community-centered solutions. They should also be uh, in the driving position to, to really and to really say what are their priorities and, and what are their are needs and not to have like a, a development approach that is like really pushing uh, things on people and that has been done before a lot with different technologies and uh, so maybe yeah uh, with the AI bubble um, doing this uh, mistake again. Thanks so much Niels. We are over time. I, I could uh, keep going <laughs> uh have this conversation for for much longer but i'm aware that we we have to close unfortunately i i, I thank you so much uh, all of you for for your time that you made available to be here with us for sharing about your super inspiring work and and for being there where you are and doing that work first of all and and all the communities uh, you're surrounded by uh, supporting you and you supporting them in in this strife to yeah to hopefully work towards a more like commons aware and context aware and regenerative aware practices uh, beyond our communities so thank you so so very much uh, we, we have a recording that will be shared at some point uh, Nadia right and it will also be shared on our channel and yeah I will leave it with this and yeah my Biggest gratitude to all of you. <laughs>